Chapter 7, Odd Number Problems 1 through 7. Under what circumstances is a t-statistic used instead of a z-score for a hypothesis test? Chapter 8 was a z-score test, our first hypothesis test. In the z-test, we were required to know the population parameters, which included the population mean and the population standard deviation. In other words, we were comparing a population to a sample. In a t-statistic, we're still comparing population, or excuse me, a sample to a population. But what's different from a z-test z is that in a t-test, we do not have pop all population parameters. In particular, the population standard deviation is not known. So to answer this question, in a t-statistic or a t-test, the population standard deviation is not known and therefore we're going to have to estimate what that population standard deviation is using the sample standard deviation So again, we'll need to estimate the population standard deviation using the sample statistics. Number three, find the, the estimated standard error for the sample mean for each of the following samples. Again, as we just learned, um, when we're performing a single sample t-test, we will not have access to the population parameters, in particular the standard deviation. Therefore, we need to estimate the population standard deviation using the sample statistic. So we're going to estimate the um, standard error. I apologize for any glitch that may have um, occurred between number one and number three. Number three, find the estimated standard error for the sample mean for each of the following samples. As we just learned, that when we're conducting a t-test opposed to a z-test, that we will not have access to the population standard deviation. Therefore, we must estimate it using the sample statistic. So we're going to use our sample statistic values to estimate what the population parameters are equal to. In order to do that, we're going to calculate um, a new value, which is referred to the estimated, estimated standard error. Um, let's first begin or review the standard error equation. Standard error is equal to the population standard deviation over the square root of n. We're familiar with that from the previous chapter. So our new equation is the estimated S sub m is equal to the standard deviation of the sample over the square root of n. However, the more um, appropriate equation or readily used equation um, is this one. Our estimated standard error is equal to the square root of our variance over n. And the reason that this is um, more readily used is because the sequence that we go through in calculating standard deviation, we begin with SS and then variance and then standard deviation. So based on that order of um, calculations, it makes more sense to use variance in this equation, in this equation, um, instead of going one more step in calculating standard deviation. So again, we'll, we'll focus on using the application of this um, equation when calculating the estimated standard error of the mean. So to proceed, we'll first need to calculate variance. Going back to our understanding of concepts in Chapter 4, variance is equal to SS, the sum of squared deviations, 
over n minus 1, which is the same as saying variance is equal to SS over the degrees of freedom, pointing out the equivalency um, of these two equations. So in this case, we would say that the variance is equal to the given value of 48 over n minus 1, which was equal to 3. So 48 in our calculus divided by 3 gives us 16. And now we can calculate what our standard um, estimated standard error is equal to. So given our equation, our estimated standard error is equal to um, the variance, 16 over n, which is 4. And we're going to take the square root of that. So we would be taking the square root of 16 divided by 4, which is 4. And the square root of 4 is equal to 2. So again, given um, the calculations for our variance, we're enabled to calculate the estimated standard error. And in this case, it's equal to 2. Again, remembering that ultimately what we're going to use this for is a, the new calculation of our t-statistic, which requires the estimated standard error opposed to the actual standard error that we use for our z-statistic. B, n is equal to 6 with SS equal to 270. Again, we begin with the calculation of variance. Variance is equal to SS over n minus 1. S variance is equal to 270 over n minus 1, which would equal 5. So in our calculators, 270 divided by 5 gives us 54. And now we can calculate our st estimated standard error. Estimated standard error is equal to our variance, the square root of our variance over n. And so the estimated standard error is equal to 54. 54 over 6. And we're going to take the square root of that. 54 divided by 6 is equal to 9. The square root of 9 is equal to 3. Again, what we're calculating, let's not lose sight of the concept of what we're calculating. The standard error is equal to the average difference between, and I'll write it here, right? Um, standard error equals average difference between m and mu, when we're talking about the distribution of sample means. And now, when we're calculating the estimated, it's just the estimated would be the equivalent. But now, instead of the actual um, expected difference, now we're estimating that average um, because we don't have population standard deviation. So again, it would be the estimated average difference between m and mu. Sorry for the uh, sloppiness there. But again, don't lose sight of what we're calculating because again, when we calculate our t-statistic, again, it's going to be the mean difference divided by our estimated um, standard error. And it's just expressing that mean difference in estimated standard error units, which we'll do in just a, a few examples to come. All right, the next one, n is equal to 12, ss equal to 132. So we're going to calculate our variance first, which is ss over n minus 1. Variance is equal to 132 over 11. Um, if we take 132 divided by 11, we should get 12. And if we calculate our estimated standard error, it's going to equal our variance over n. We're going to take the square root of that. So our estimated standard error is equal to 12 over 12. And we're going to take the square root of that. It's essentially the square root of 1 and it's equal to 1. So again, what we've just calculated, the estimated average difference between a sample mean and a population mean and the distribution of sample means um, when we're working with a t-distribution.
Number five, we're going to learn how to use our new T table uh, in the appendix. So we're going to find the critical T values similar to what we did with the Z distribution or unit normal table to find our critical Z. We are going to utilize a new T distribution to identify the critical values to um, help us draw our conclusions about our hypothesis test. Again, a t-distribution is slightly different um, because we are estimating the variability um, based on samples versus having actual population parameters. So from our reading, we've recognized that the t-distribution is going to be a little flatter um, because that denotes greater variability opposed to a z-distribution of sample means because um, that has actual exact variability coming from the population. So let's look at um, our T distribution and figure out what our critical Z's are for the sample sizes. The things that we're going to need to know are, um, one, are we utilizing a one or two tail test? And that'll be a given. In this case, we're utilizing a two tail test. And the alpha is important. In this case, it's 5%. And then we need to know our sample size. Sample size is important because the way that we enter the T table is by using degrees of freedom. Degrees of freedom is calculated by n minus 1. So in this case, degrees of freedom would equal 6 minus 1 is equal to 5. And we'll see that that's how we enter the table to find our critical T values. Okay. So here is an example, I'm sorry for all the switching of pages, um, I meant to pause the video. So here is a T distribution and um, the column degrees of freedom is how we're going to enter. And what I want to point out is that we have two tiers. This one is for one tail and this one is for two tail. And then the proportions tell us the alpha level that we're utilizing. So again, we enter the um, table using degrees of freedom, and we are going to focus on the second tier, which is two-tail for this particular problem. We're going to find the alpha. So it's not 0 0.5, 0 0.2, 0 0.1. We were given the alpha 0.5. So again, it was 0 0.05, two tails that was specified for our, um, our test of significance and we had n equal to 6 so degrees of freedom was equal to 5 so we're going to go down to 5 here and enter the distribution and see where those two things <clears throat> connect um, and we see that they connect there so our critical t is equal to 2.5 Five seven one again it would be positive negative because we're talking about a two-tailed test so take into account the different tiers if we're using a one-tailed or two-tailed and then the proportion oh, excuse me the um, percentage for the alpha level just for a second I'm going to erase here something so that you can see this um, if we are talking about a two-tailed test we've learned this in the past that if uh, we have alpha equal to 5%. That means there's 95% in the center, 5% is left over, and that means we have 2.5 in this tail and 2.5 in the other tail. So notice what it says up here in, in the one tail test. Notice that it says 2.5. So again, we don't have to take responsibility of, of um, splitting that 5% in half as we had to with finding the critical Z value in the unit normal table. That's already been taken care of for us. So all we need to do is find the appropriate um, um, alpha level in the actual tier, so one-tailed or two-tailed. In other words, if we were conducting a one-tailed test at 5%, we would focus here and then again use the appropriate degrees of freedom to find our critical T. So it's a combination of a couple of things that we need to factor into so, so that we can find the actual critical T value. So going in this process, it was degrees of, equal, degrees of freedom equal to 5. And then we were using, let me erase all of this to go back to what we were doing, alpha 5. 
And so where those two things intersected is the critical T for this example. Okay, so our answer is, um, our critical T is equal to positive negative 2.571. Okay, what uh, I'd also like to point out too is that because the T distribution is flatter, illustrating more variability, a T test is a little harder to pass um, simply because of that fact. Um, and so we'll see that our critical values are, are a bit higher than we saw for our Z test. The next one says um, N is equal to 12. So our degrees of freedom, degrees of freedom is equal to 12 minus 1, and we get 11. So we're going to find our critical T value using the same process. And again, it's going to be a positive negative because of the fact that we're using a two-tailed test. Okay, so again, um, N in that problem, N was equal to 12. So degrees of freedom equal to 11. That's how we're going to enter the table. So 11 here. We are going to utilize this tier, which is the two-tailed at 5%. And so we're just going to move across until we see where those two things intersect. And we get a value of 2.201. And that's our critical T. So our critical T was equal to 2.201. And then last one, our degrees of freedom are equal to 24 minus 1, which is equal to 23. We're going to find our critical T value. Again, um, it's going to be based on entering the table using degrees of freedom and then intersecting it with our two-tailed test at 5% alpha. Okay, so we had n, n is equal to 24 degrees of freedom, therefore it would equal 23. So we enter here, 23. We're going to use the two-tailed tier at 5%. We're going to move over and see where those two things intersect. And we find that they intersect at positive negative 2.069. So we get a critical T of 2.069. What I'd like to point out is that um, the relationship be between degrees of freedom and critical T is a um, negative correlation or inverse relationship that as n increased, as we saw it increase from 6 to 12 to 24, our critical t decreased. So again, as n, whoops, as n increased, critical t decreased. So in other words, the, the test becomes a little easier to pass um, the critical T comes closer to the center of the distribution of sample means as N increases, which makes sense as we've learned um, the size of N is important. We want large sample sizes to be representative of the populations. Smaller Ns um, are not representative, smaller samples are not representative, so the, the test should be more challenging to pass. We would need a really large T value if we are using a small sample. If we have a large T, we need a lesser T value to pass um, this hypothesis test. Also, let me um, point out some other things <clears throat> in the T distribution that are important. So as I mentioned, as um, N increases, so as N increases, our critical T decreases. So we see that <clears throat> if we take any of our alpha levels, so let's just take those in the 5% category. So we see that we're decreasing, right, as N um, or degrees of freedom is increasing. So these values here in this column are decreasing as this column here, right, if those values are increasing. Um, and then what's important to um, notice, very important to notice, is that as we get to 
120. Well, first of all, as we get to the values of 130, we see that we skip values. Um, and that's just showing that we don't expect significant differences in, in um, the effects of increasing sample size, so the critical values do not change significantly. Um, so again, not, not big differences in T, critical T values as we, we change from 30 to 40, in 40 to 60, in 60 to 120, and then from 120 to infinity. When we reach 120, some things, um, or infinity more importantly, some things should be quite evident. So these um, Z values of 1.96 and 1.64 should be familiar as well as 2.3 um, 2, 6 and um, 2.5. If we round all of those, we're really talking about Z, um, T values of 1.65, 1.96, 2.33, 2.38. And those should all look familiar. What, what this is demonstrating is that as N approaches infinity, the distribution of T, uh, or the T distribution becomes perfectly normal and mimics a Z distribution. Again, a T distribution is slightly different from a Z distribution because it's all based on estimated values on sample statistics. And a Z distribution is coming from population parameters. So it is normal. And a T distribution is flatter, more varied. But as n increases and reaches infinity, um, greater than 120 in fact, when it gets to be larger than 120, the distribution is normal and the, the t, critical t values are identical to our z values. Um, again, these should all look very familiar, so a very important point to make. Um, also pertains to the fact that when we are engaging in research and our sample sizes are less than 100, a T test is more appropriate than um, when we have sample sizes much larger than that. Um, so if you're conducting research using a sample less than 100, a T test is the better test to implement opposed to a Z test. Number seven, the following sample was obtained from a population with unknown parameters. We have the following scores, 6, 12, 0, 13, 4, and 7. We're asked to compute the sample mean and standard deviation. And we're asked to recognize that these um, values, the mean and standard deviation, are descriptive statistics used to sa summarize the sample data. Um, these are the building blocks that will then allow us to um, conduct a T test of significance. So it's just a refresher of uh, skills that we've developed in previous chapters. So if I'm asked to co compute the mean um, and standard deviation, I would set the problem up in the following format. Um, so I'm going to list my x values. So 6, 12, 0, 13, 4, and 7. And I'm going to take the sum, the sum of x, so that I can calculate the mean the mean of my sample is equal to sum of x over n. So if I take the sum of this column here, on our calculator 6 plus 12 plus 0, 13, 4, and 7, we should get the sum equal to 42. And we have um, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 scores. So to calculate the average um, of this sample, 42 divided by 6, we get an average score of 7. Next, um, to calculate the standard deviation, I'll need to calculate sum of squared deviation and then variance, and then that will allow me to calculate standard deviation. Um, so the sum of squared deviations using the computational formula equation is the sum of x squared minus the sum of x squared over n. I'm going to replace variables. So I know the sum of x, I just used that in my average equation, which was equal to 42. 
going to square that. n is equal to 6. What's missing is the sum of scores that are squared, so I'm going to calculate that here. So I'm going to square all my scores. So 6 squared is 36, 12 squared 144, 0 squared is 0, 13 squared 169, 4 squared 16, and 7 squared 49. Now I can take the sum of all scores that have been squared. So if I take the sum of this column here, in our calculators we should get a summation of 414. So if we take um, this calculation, um, so we are going to take 42, square it, divide by 6, and subtract it from 414. So I'll give you a second to do that in your calculators to ensure that we're all coming up with the same values. So 42 squared, divide by 6, subtract it from 4. For 14, we should get 120. So sum of squared deviations is equal to 120. This now allows us to calculate variance. Variance is SS over N minus 1. So variance is equal to 120 over 5. So 120 divided by 5 gives us 24. And we then can use that to calculate our standard deviation. Standard deviation is equal to the square root of our variance. So standard deviation is equal to the square root of 24. And we get standard deviation is equal to, if we round um, two digits right of the decimal, we get 4.90. And that's our final answer. We've calculated the mean, the mean of this distribution, and our standard deviation. We're going to use the um, standard deviation of this sample to now calculate the standard error of the mean in the next um, part of this problem. Okay, so 7b says compute the estimated standard error of m. Again, recognizing that now we've moved into inferential values versus descriptive values in the previous example, which were the mean and standard deviation. And we're going to now calculate the standard error of the mean. And we're going to, I'm going to demonstrate the um, application of both equations. Before I write that, let's again review in the previous e chapter we had the luxury of having standard deviation of the population we were act, act, able to calculate the standard error using population standard deviation um, because this is unknown we must now estimate that value and we're going to use um, our standard deviation of the sample to do so. So I'm going to use this equation and I'll also use the variance equation which is more readily used in this chapter. So if our stand, estimated standard error is equal to standard deviation divided by the square root of n, we just calculated our standard deviation which was 4.9 divided by the square root of, of n. n was equal to so in our calculators, if we enter 4.9 divided by the square root of 6, we should get um, a very long decimal, but if we round two digits right of the decimal, we'd get 2.00. Um, the other equation that, again, um, I stated is more readily used simply because of the steps required to calculate standard deviation, we begin with um, to variance, um, we can use our variance equation or value first. So variance was equal to 24 divided by our sample size, which was 6. So we can do 26, 24 divided by 6. 
which gives us 4. Square root of 4 is equal to 2. So just showing it's a good illustration that if we use either equation, we'll get the exact same answer um, for the estimated standard error. Um, keep in mind that the purpose of calculating the estimated standard error is so that we can calculate our T statistic. Um, our T, which will be demonstrated in the next um, videos, but just a little preview, is the mean difference divided by our estimated error. So it looks very similar to our, T, um, our Z statistic that was previously um, calculated. So we have our sample mean minus the population mean, also known as the actual mean difference. And now instead of the actual standard um, error, it's the estimated standard error. So process is almost identical. It's just that added step of calculating estimated standard error using sample statistics.